Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This will be a brief review on the autonomic nervous system, or I should say relatively brief review on the autonomic nervous system. Now, you might be thinking, why should I know about the autonomic nervous system if I'm working in clinical practice? This is really heavy on first-year medical school physiology. Why, what good does this serve me? And the answer is it serves you a lot of good because there are a lot of little things that you pick up along the way of your career uh, things that may be pharmacology, things that may be uh, different disorders that really get tied in by the autonomic nervous system. So something like myasthenia gravis and treating asthma and treating heart failure, uh, things that don't seem very related, but they really all are related because they all pertain to the autonomic nervous system. So if you understand the autonomic nervous system, it will really help put these things into perspective and give you a dimension of understanding that you might not otherwise have. Now, if you're taking step one in the middle of medical school, uh, then you'll want to know the details of this. And I'm going to go into some of the nitty gritty details, and you can skip over that if you're not taking step one, and I'll, I'll give you a warning. Uh, because I don't think it's all, uh, good to really burden your brain with too much uh, peripheral information if you don't have to. Uh, so this will be a good talk if you're going to be taking step one, but I think this is good for anybody in clinical practice because having an understanding of the basics will help you tie in things together that you might not otherwise see. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can click the link below in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner of the video and it should link you up. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. If you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium videos in which I go over case studies as well as how to formulate a differential diagnosis and treatment plan which should come in handy for you as you gear up to study for step three of US MLE. And also useful for clinical practice, because as you know, clinical practice is not a multiple choice test. Thank you very much in advance for your patronage. So we're gonna do a quick overview of the autonomic nervous system, get ourselves acquainted with what we're going to talk about. We'll talk about the transmission of two different chemicals. Uh, one being a single molecule, acetylcholine, the other being a class of molecules, the catecholamines, which includes epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are really the ones that we're going to be concerned about here, though, because they tie into our receptors. And then we're going to talk about those receptors, the cholinergic receptors, which include the nicotinic receptors, and N being the ones that are on the nerves, and M, which is not part of the autonomic nervous system, but does have some important implications for disease and pharmacology. Uh, that's not going to be a huge focus of our talk here, though. And then the muscarinic receptors, M1, M2, and M3. There's also M4 and M5, but that's not going to be too important for what we're going to be talking about. And then the adrenergic receptors, which respond to epinephrine and norepinephrine, and this is alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. And if you work in the clinic, you hear lots and lots about alpha receptors and beta receptors, chiefly in pharmacology, alpha agonists, beta blockers, etc. So the autonomic nervous system is a division of the peripheral nervous system, and it's that part of the peripheral nervous system which is under vegetative or involuntary control. It is regulated centrally via the hypothalamus. Remember that the hypothalamus is kind of the thermostat of your body. And what is a thermostat? So you have a thermostat in your house, and let's say you want the temperature in your house to be 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Nice, comfortable temperature. It's what I keep my house at. And let's say that it's uh, you leave the window open. It gets cold at night. It gets down to 50 degrees. And now all of a sudden your house is 67 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a little chilly. Well, you, there's two ways you can warm your house up. Either you can get out of bed in the cold and turn the heat on, or you can have this nice thermostat that sets it at 74 degrees, and when the temperature cools down, it kicks the heat on automatically. That's really nice, right? So that is essentially an autonomic nervous system. You have a thermostat that is going to kick in the heat without you even telling it to do anything. Likewise, if you have a party and you have all these bodies and body heat and it causes the temperature in the room to go up to 78 degrees Fahrenheit, it can turn the fans on. 
that's what the autonomic nervous system does for your body. And it does other things. It does do temperature control, but it does other things. It's basically so you don't have to tell your body to do every little thing. It can do it autonomically or automatically. So the autonomic nervous system is divided into two different parts, two different divisions. The sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight, fright, and flight response, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest. Now, that being said, these two systems are always active. It's a matter of balance. So if you're getting chased by a bear, you want your sympathetic nervous system to be a little bit more active, but both are active always at the same time. Likewise, if you're going to bed and you need to digest that burger that you ate a couple hours before bed, then you want your parasympathetic nervous system to be more active. Now the autonomic nervous system can be uh, anatomically divided up into two different types of nerves. Preganglionic, which runs from the spinal cord to the autonomic ganglia, and postganglionic, which runs from that autonomic ganglia to the effector organ, which is really what we're concerned with because this is going to be the organ that's under control here. So the preganglionic neuron, when it terminates at the autonomic ganglia, there's a receptor that it's going to affect, and that's called a nicotinic receptor, or NN, N standing for neuronal. You may also hear it referred to as an NG receptor. It's the same thing. G can stand for ganglionic. So the nicotinic receptor, the chemical that's responsible for activating it, is acetylcholine. We'll talk about that more in a little bit greater detail in a little bit. The postganglionic neuron, at the very end of this, is the effector organ. There's two different types of receptor here. There's the muscarinic receptor, which responds to acetylcholine, and the adrenergic receptor, which responds to norepinephrine and epinephrine. And it's the adrenergic receptor that is divided into alpha and beta, more specifically alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. Then you have the adrenal medulla. So thinking back to embryology, remember the adrenal medulla is uh, under is is developed from nerve tissue, and this is under direct sympathetic preganglionic innervation. It has NN receptors, and so when these NN receptors are activated by acetylcholine, it causes the adrenal medulla to spill out epinephrine into the bloodstream, and that epinephrine can go other places and activate effector organs. Nicotinic and muscarinic receptors together are known as cholinergic receptors. So when we talk about something having cholinergic or anticholinergic activity, we're talking about having activity on these receptors. So this is anatomically how the how the prefer, uh, the sorry the uh, autonomic nervous system is is comp comprised. So you have sympathetic and that's going to be T1 through about L2 or L3. And these are where your sympathetic uh, chains are coming off of. And this is ganglia here. So this is your spinal cord and then ganglia. And then you have uh, your brain stem and your sacral spinal cord, and that's parasympathetic. And all of these organs, they each have sympathetic and parasympathetic control. There's only a few organs which have only one or the other. Uh, so as a rule, just think of everything having some sympathetic and some para parasympathetic control. So this is just an illustration here. As you can see, parasympathetic, you run your, your uh, preganglionic, neuro, uh, preganglionic neuron runs to the ganglia. It's got NN receptors at that, uh, at the, body of the postganglionic neuron, and then that runs to muscarinic receptors at the effector organ. Sympathetic, uh, you have both uh, a, uh, you, you have your nicotinic neuronal uh, receptors, and then this can terminate at the effector organ, either with uh, your adrenergic receptors, that being responsive to epinephrine, norepinephrine, and uh, also muscarinic receptors, those being responsive to acetylcholine. Uh, for the most part, when we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system, we're, uh, we're talking about adrenergic receptors. Those are going to be at your target organs. The only, the only effector organ that is muscarinic and sympathetic is going to be sweat glands. And then this is just for comparison. You have motor neurons. This is a lower motor neuron coming off the spinal cord. There are nicotinic receptors associated with, with your somatic nervous system. Uh, that's going to be at skeletal muscle. 
So remember that skeletal muscle, in order for it to contract, it needs acetylcholine. Uh, this is a specific type of nicotinic receptor called the NM receptor. This is not part of your, your autonomic nervous system, but it does have some important implications, particularly for anesthesia. It's those NM receptors that we block when we want to cause neuromuscular blockade to induce paralysis during anesthesia. So you'll see succinylcholine, tubocurarine, which we don't really give anymore, but you'll give kind of a derivative of that, uh, something chemically related. Those would be things like rocuronium, vecuronium, pancuronium. And so that does come into play here, but I figured it's good to talk about that for completion's sake. Now, you see here mecamylamine, trimethophan. We don't use these clinically, but it is good to know, especially if you're taking step one, these are ganglionic blockers. Essentially, what they're going to do is they're going to wipe out both parasympathetic and sympathetic control. So you'll want to know that for step one, step two, step three, clinical practice, it's really inconsequential. This is just another illustration of what we just talked about. So notice your nicotinic receptors up here in the ganglia, muscarinic receptors uh, down here at the effector organs, and then you also have uh, your muscular nicotinic receptors, NM receptors at skeletal muscle, but this is not part of the autonomic nervous system. So remember that th this is all about signals. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we, we need to, when we have a signal coming down the axon, we need to get this, this, these chemicals, either acetylcholine or norepinephrine, we need to get that out into the synapse so it can transmit a signal to either the next neuron or to the effector organ. So you have this electrical signal coming down, and what you want to do here, we're talking about acetylcholine, we, we need to get acetylcholine out of the neuron and into the synapse. So how does this work? Well, first of all, you need to synthesize acetylcholine, and we do that by converting choline uh, via acetyl-CoA and combining the two of those together to form acetylcholine. Okay, Biochemically, probably a little bit more complex than that, but that's how we make acetylcholine. You have channels that will bring choline in and this can actually be blocked and there's a particular uh, drug that can do that which is really inconsequential for clinical practice but I will uh, I don't have it yet uh, just there it is hemicholinium uh, and that does that so just for completion's sake so we make acetylcholine ultimately we are going to bring this into vesicles which store it and it also prevents it from being degraded so you store the acetylcholine in vesicles. And what happens then is you get an impulse down the neuron, coming down the axon, and when the voltage goes up from that, that action potential, it's gonna draw calcium into the terminal button. And when you bring calcium in, these are voltage-gated calcium channels, so you get uh, electrical activity, it opens these, these channels, uh, these calcium channels and when that calcium comes in it helps these vesicles dock and when these vesicles dock it can then put acetylcholine out into the synapse the space in between the end of the axon and the effector organ or the the, the next neuron so that is what we're talking about here when we talk about n-type voltage-gated calcium channels. Basically, it's just a calcium channel that responds to uh, increased voltage, and it brings calcium in, and calcium helps vesicles dock and spill their contents out into the synapse. So when we're talking about something called Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, that may ring a bell. What that is, is it's an antibody against these calcium channels. And so these calcium channels can't work. And so even though you're getting, you're, you're getting a signal down these nerves, you can't bring the calcium in. Therefore, you can't spill acetylcholine out. Therefore, you cannot contract skeletal muscle or other things. Uh, but you can't contract, importantly, skeletal muscle. Because remember, skeletal muscle needs acetylcholine. So with activity, the more and more and more that you work at it, ultimately you will be able to bring enough calcium in here to spill some acetylcholine out. And so that's why with Lambert-Eaton syndrome, with 
more and more activity, the more you try, you'll ultimately be able to get a, a muscle contraction. And that stands in contrast to myasthenia gravis, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Another important implication here is botulinum toxin. So botulinum toxin prevents the exocytosis of these vesicles. It prevents them from spilling their contents into the synapse. And so if you can't get acetylcholine into the synapse, you can't contract your muscle, and you get a flaccid paralysis, and that's what botulism comes from. Botulinum toxin, most toxic substance known to man. And then, let's see, this is not working for me really well today. There we go. Okay, so this is myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis is where you have antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor. So in this case, it doesn't matter how much acetylcholine you spill out. You have a receptor that's blocking, competitively blocking the, the receptors. And this antibody is blocking the receptor. And so you can spill all the acetylcholine you want. Oh, it's not going to help. And so that's why with myasthenia gravis, the more you work at it, it doesn't matter. Because you're just spilling acetylcholine to try to get to a receptor that's being blocked. So that's where, even though Lambert-Eaton syndrome and myasthenia gravis look very similar, one of them will improve with work and the other does not. Now there's one more thing that uh, is not illustrated on here that comes into play, and that's acetylcholine esterase. So you have acetylcholine in the synapse. You don't want acetylcholine to just stay there, because if acetylcholine just stayed there, these receptors would be constitutively active, and you would not be able to rest your muscle, and so you would essentially get a paralysis. And so we want to get rid of acetylcholine pretty much just as quickly as it comes out. And acetylcholine esterase is the enzyme that, that, uh, that does that. And if you have anything that blocks acetylcholine esterase, here we're talking about like organophosphate poisoning, you can get paralysis from that and all sorts of awful things. So what are these receptors for acetylcholine? Well, this can be your muscarinic receptors, and these can also be your nicotinic receptors. Both of those respond to acetylcholine. Okay. You know, I re-downloaded my PowerPoint and uh, it is not working really well for me. <laughs> okay, so how about, how do we get norepinephrine? So remember, this is what goes on to your adrenergic receptors. And it works very similarly. The whole idea of it is that ultimately what happens is you store this all in vesicles and when you get a signal coming down the axon, Allowing calcium in, it helps you dock those vesicles and spill the contents out into the synapse. So first we need to create what's in these vesicles. And for our purpose, we're talking about norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine, but we're really going to be focused on norepinephrine here. So all of these things ultimately get, uh, get, get created from tyrosine, and there are different biochemical steps, but tyrosine is really the big precursor and it's actually tyrosine going to DOPA, that's the rate limiting step. But all of these things can get broken down. Norepinephrine, dopamine, DOPA can all get broken down by an enzyme called MAO, monoamine oxidase. And that is good because you don't want to keep, you don't want infinite amounts of these catecholamines sitting in the nerve because you can imagine if you have tons of it and then you get a, you get an action potential, you're going to be spilling way too much catecholamine into your synapse. Uh, so this kind of keeps things in check, and that is what MAO does. And MAO, as you probably know, if you know your psychiatry, is one of the, uh, one of the enzymes that we can block if we want more catecholamine sitting in your nerves. So MAO is, is an, an enzyme of importance. So basically, you're getting all of this stuff into these vesicles, and then when you get an action potential, you get calcium coming in. These are, again, voltage-gated calcium channels, although I don't know if they're exactly the same as the ones for acetylcholine. Uh, my knowledge of physiology is not that complex, but uh, essentially it's the same thing going on here. Calcium helps you dock, and then you get norepinephrine, in this case, spilling out into the synapse. Now, there are a couple really important things here. Remember, with acetylcholine, we had acetylcholine esterase helps keep things in check. Well, we have a couple different ways that we can keep this system in check with norepinephrine. One, you can metabolize it, similar to acetylcholine esterase. Here, this enzyme is called catechol o methyltransferase, and basically this just metabolizes norepinephrine into inactive metabolites. 
Another really important way that we can do this is by a receptor that is presynaptically oriented. It sits on the, the presynaptic neuron, and this is known as an alpha-2 receptor. It's one of our adrenergic receptors. Basically, what you're doing here is you're taking this norepinephrine, it binds to the alpha-2 receptor, and this sets off a chain of events which is going to reduce the amount of calcium coming into the neuron, and that is a really good thing because that's going to prevent the docking of these, uh, of these uh, vesicles and ultimately will reduce the amount of norepinephrine coming into the synapse. So it's a negative feedback mechanism. And we'll look at, if, you, you know, if you're taking step one, you'll want to know this, but if, you, if, if you're really curious, I'll talk about the, uh, the exact cascade of how this is going on. But this is the alpha-2 receptor. It is an adrenergic receptor that works in negative feedback. And that's why things like alpha-2 agonists, as you might remember, actually has the effect of lowering your blood pressure, whereas agonists for all these other things, if they're going to do anything, they're going to raise your blood pressure. Alpha-2 is kind of the, the zebra of, of the, the flock of horses, or herd of horses, I guess. Okay, so that is how catecholamines work. So as you know, MAOIs, very, uh, not so much commonly given in psychiatry, but you do see them come up. Uh, so that is a, uh, a class of drugs that is given out from time to time. And that's things like isocarboxazid, phenylzine, uh, selegiline. Uh, those are different MAO inhibitors. Reserpine is a medication that is really also not given too much anymore, but you'll want to know it for step one because it works on this pathway. Basically, it blocks the incorporation of catecholamines into these vesicles. There's norepinephrine releasing agents that promotes the release of these vesicles, uh, promotes the release of norepinephrine. Uh, so that's amphetamines, ephedrine, pseudofed, phentermine, and tyramine. And tyramine, remember, is that stuff that's in wine and cheese. It's in your food. And this is why you do not want to combine MAOIs with wine or cheese. Think about how big of a problem this is. You're blocking MAO, so you've got all this norepinephrine, and all this dopamine, all of these catecholamines now sitting in your nerve. You have tons of it because you're not metabolizing it. And now you give somebody something that is going to cause you to release all that stuff that you've got sitting in your nerves. You can see how that would be a big problem. And these people can become really hypertensive as if you're just starting an IV line and pouring epinephrine and norepinephrine into their bloodstream. Bad, bad, bad. That's why we can't combine MAOIs with cheese or wine. And then you have tricyclic antidepressants and cocaine. What these do is they work on this, this uh, reuptake channel, for lack of a better word. So you get norepinephrine, you can, you, you can take this back up into the nerve, uh, into the, the presynaptic nerve. And what you're doing here is, is just another way of, 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 of balancing the amount of norepinephrine you have in your synapse. And so this, this reuptake channel. Uh, this can be blocked, and it's blocked by tricyclic antidepressants, and it's also blocked by cocaine. Uh, so if you're blocking that, you're going to have more norepinephrine in your synapse. So the receptors of the autonomic nervous system. You'll want to know what each of these receptors do. If you're taking step one, you'll want to know the type. So the nicotinic receptors, these are both ion channels, so they're not very complicated, although there's some debate as to whether they are more complicated. The NN, remember, these are your neuronal type nicotinic receptors. These are uh, at your ganglia. They're also in the adrenals. The NM is not part of your autonomic nervous system, but they are important because they sit at the neuromuscular junction and they help with muscle contraction. The M1, so this is muscarinic type 1, these, are re these receptors help you uh, salivate. They help with gastric secretions uh, like stomach acid. And then other, basically secretions, okay? M1 thinks secretions. M2, the, this sits on your heart, and when it's activated, it reduces your heart rate. M3 is smooth muscle. So this does smooth muscle contraction, except for in the vasculature where it causes dilation. 
So those are your muscarinic receptors. And if you look at the muscarinic receptors and what they do, they basically do what your autonomic or what your parasympathetic nervous system is supposed to do. It's supposed to help you rest and digest. Rest, decrease your heart rate, digest, salivate, make gastric secretions, and so forth. Then you have your alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. These are your adrenergic receptors. They are under the control of norepinephrine and epinephrine. Alpha-1, think vasoconstriction. That's really what it does. It, uh, it causes vasoconstriction, basically shunts blood away from organs and towards skeletal muscle. Because it causes vasoconstriction, it causes an increase in peripheral resistance, and that is going to increase your blood pressure. It will also have the effect of slightly lowering your heart rate because of the fact that there is this reflex bradycardia going on to try to maintain some semblance of a normal blood pressure. Alpha-2, remember, is negative feedback. This will lower your blood pressure because it ultimately is going to reduce the amount of norepinephrine that is put out by these neurons. Beta-1 is all about the heart. So when beta-1 is stimulated, it increases the efficiency and the output of your heart. So it's going to increase heart rate, increase stroke volume. Uh, this is another really good thing you want going on if you're getting chased by a bear. Beta-2 is really about smooth muscle, especially in the bronchi. So this, when stimulated, causes bronchodilation. So you'll see here these types. And this is something that if you're, if you're just worried about clinical practice, you can tune me out. If you're curious or if you're taking step one, you can take a listen to me now. So we have these things called G-protein coupled receptors. And these, these receptors, these cholinergic receptors, they're all G-protein coupled. And what that means is that you have a receptor and then you also have this protein on it called a G-protein. And a G-protein basically does special things. You have three different types for our purposes here. GQ, GI, and GS. GQ is kind of in a class of its own. GI and GS are a class of their own. So what GQ does when it is activated when you have a receptor and this the ones that are linked to GQ are alpha 1 and then M1 and M3 when either alpha 1 sees norepinephrine or M1 and M3 see acetylcholine it activates the GQ unit and GQ what it does the only thing it does is it activates a protein called phospholipase C and phospholipase C will see this uh, this this molecule that sits on the, the uh, cell surface called PIP2. Don't even ask me what that stands for. It's like phosphatidyl and nosotol something something. Anyway, what it does, phospholipase C, is it cleaves PIP2 into uh, this sort of backbone diacylglycerol and IP3. IP3 stands for inositol triphosphate. And what IP3 does is it causes the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, and that allows for smooth muscle contraction and vasoconstriction. And you can imagine that's going to be an alpha-1 thing, because remember, alpha-1 is all about vasoconstriction. It also makes sense that that's going to be an M1 thing and an M3 thing, because M1 is about getting those secretions secreted and you're going to need some level of vasoconstriction to push those secretions out. Okay, so alpha-1, M1, and M3 are all GQ coupled, and this is a classic question on step one. They're going to give you something, maybe like an alpha-1 uh, agonist medication, and then ask you uh, which of the following uh, molecules is this not associated with, and adenylocyclase would be not associated with. Okay, and then there's the GI and GS. I stands for inhibitory, S stands for stimulatory. Inhibitory, stimulatory of what? And that's adenylocyclase. So remember that alpha-2 is basically your negative feedback mechanism. And M2, the muscarinic receptor, what M2 does is it slows your heart down. So both of these have the effect of slowing things or blocking things. And so it makes sense that they're associated with an inhibitory G protein. So what this does is it inhibits adenylylcyclase. Well, what does adenylylcyclase do? Adenylylcyclase is an enzyme that takes ATP, shoves off two inorganic phosphates, and makes cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP is a very important molecule in the cell, very important signaling molecule. 
Now, on the other hand, GS, stimulatory, stimulates adenylocyclase, so it promotes the production of cyclic AMP. GI reduces the, the creation of cyclic AMP. GS promotes the formation of cyclic AMP. And GS is going to be your beta 1 and beta 2. So if you think of just muscle contraction, just think of just regular old muscle contraction, smooth muscle contraction. Well, you're blocking that with alpha-2 and M2, because remember, alpha-2, it's in negative feedback. M2, it's, uh, it's your heart rate. Beta-1 and beta-2, well, you need to, uh, with, with uh, beta-1, you're stimulating your heart, right? So uh, that is uh, going to be stimulatory. So remember what adenylocyclase does. It makes cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP has an important effect, and that is that it, activates a protein called protein kinase A. And protein kinase A, when it is activated, does two important things. One, it activates calcium channels. Remember those calcium channels. Going back, let's, okay. So alpha-2, when, it, uh, when it's activated, uh, or it's, okay, so when alpha-2 is activated, meaning that it's going to block adenylocyclase, and when it blocks adenylocyclase, it reduces the amount of cyclic AMP. By reducing the amount of cyclic AMP, you reduce the amount of active protein kinase A. And protein kinase A is responsible for getting these helping these channels get open, these calcium channels. So if you activate an alpha-2 receptor, you have the effect of reducing adenylocyclase activity, reducing the amount of cyclic AMP, therefore reducing the amount of activated protein kinase A and reducing the amount of activated or of, of open activated calcium channels. And that is why when you activate an alpha-2 receptor, you reduce the amount of norepinephrine being put out into the synapse. Right? It all makes sense now, doesn't it? Uh, so on the other hand, uh, if, if you activate a beta-1 or beta-2 receptor, you're going to increase cyclic AMP, increase active protein kinase A, and you'll help re uh, with the release of neurotransmitters. But the really important thing with the beta-2 receptors uh, comes here with the deactivation of myosin-like kinase. And what's going to happen here is that beta-2 gets activated, activated adenylocyclase, increase cyclic AMP, increase activated protein kinase A, and that allows for vasodilation, smooth muscle relaxation, and this is how you relax your bronchi. Okay, so this is all step one stuff, all right? If you, you're taking step two, step three, please don't remember this. This is useless. So your nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, these exist on, this is kind of just recapping some stuff here a little bit. These exist on ganglionic synapse and at the adrenal medulla, those are NN receptors, and on the neuromuscular end plate, those are NM. NN can transmit the signal to the postganglionic neurons or to the adrenal medulla, which in turn releases epinephrine into the bloodstream. Activity at the NN receptor in the CNS, it does exist there, may play a role at promoting memory. And that is why we see some issues with acetylcholine uh, implicated in Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. And M, remember, that's at your, your skeletal muscle. And so when it's activated, it opens sodium-potassium channels, ultimately resulting in muscle depolarization and contraction. And the transmitter here, of course, is acetylcholine. The muscarinic receptors, these exist on various effector organs and in the CNS, and basically they just mediate parasympathetic activity. So Look at what M1, M2, and M3 do. It's all parasympathetic stuff. So the exocrine glands, M1 is on the exocrine glands, helps you with salivation, gastric acid secretion. M2 exists on the heart. It really just slows down the heart. And M3 exists on the smooth muscle, bronchoconstriction. This is going to be really important when we talk about organophosphate poisoning. This is one way it can kill you. Uh, it helps with urinating. It helps with uh, some degree of vasodilation. It will contract the sphincter pupillae, and the sphincter pupillae is what contracts your pupil, and so that causes meiosis. It will also help contract the ciliary muscle, which helps you conform the, your lens shape to accommodate, and then it also allows pancreas uh, insulin secretion from the pancreas. So that's, again, another thing that you want to do when you are resting is you want to uh, pull 
sugar into your cells so that you can uh, you can do things with that sugar, metabolic things. And the transmitter for muscarinic receptor, this should say muscarinic receptor, is of course acetylcholine. And then these are your adrenergic receptors. So lots and lots of things that the adrenergic receptors do. I want to break it down into just a few important words. So alpha-1, think vasoconstriction. That's really the big thing that alpha-1 does, vasoconstriction. Now you're going to have alpha-1 receptors on your prostate, and that's going to be important when we talk about some of the medications that affect alpha-1. But the big thing with alpha-1 is it's vasoconstriction. When alpha-1 receptors are activated, it causes vasoconstriction. Now where are you constricting vessels? You're basically constricting it everywhere except the vessels that are going to skeletal muscle. So if you're getting chased by a bear, is it really important that you are that, that you're getting uh, that you're getting blood to your GI tract? No. Vascularizing your, your GI tract, perfusing your GI tract is not so important if you're getting chased by a bear or a knife wielding, machete wielding terrorist. Okay, so so we're really concerned about getting blood to skeletal muscle when we are under sympathetic control, when, when we're in danger. So you're, you're vasoconstricting because it helps get your blood to more important organs when you're under threat. Now, it does say brain, uh, but we're not vasoconstricting to the point where you're going to get brain damage. So that's just in there for completion's sake. So basically, it's vasoconstriction to increase perfusion of your skeletal muscle. Now there's other places where you'll see uh, alpha-1 receptors uh, in the, the uh, urogenital tract uh, and so forth and ciliary body, but uh, that's less important for now. We'll talk about that in greater detail later on. And then it does also play a role in glucose metabolism, which I'll tie that back in a little bit. Alpha-2, remember alpha-2 is all about negative feedback. So alpha-2 inhibits insulin release, stimulates glucagon release, uh, but most importantly inhibits the release of norepinephrine. Beta-1 is all about the heart. So again, if you're getting chased by a bear, what's another important thing? Aside from getting, getting uh, vasculature and perfusion to your skeletal muscle, another important thing is that your heart is working at maximum efficiency. And that is exactly what the beta-1 receptors, when stimulated, help you do. It makes your heart work really nicely. And so it's going to increase your heart rate. It's going to increase the force of your contraction. We call that positive inotropy. It's going to increase your ejection fraction. Really, really good things. Now, it's not necessarily good if you have poor heart perfusion and you want to avoid having a heart attack. But if you're getting chased by a bear, it's a really good thing. So beta-1, think heart. And then beta-2, what I really want you to think of is bronchi. So when we give somebody albuterol, we're stimulating their beta-2 receptors, and that's going to help them relax the smooth muscle of their bronchi, of their respiratory tract. That's the most important thing that beta-2 does. Now there are other things, as you can see, that has some genitourinary functions. It also plays a role in metabolism along with alpha-1. So really, the, the way you can think about this is, let's say you're in a fight-or-flight response. What, what do you want to happen with your blood glucose level? Do you want your blood glucose level to go down or up, if anything? You want more glucose available, because the more glucose avail is available, the more you can metabolize that glucose into energy. And so both alpha-1 and beta-2, when they are activated, they are going to, it's going to promote the creation of glucose, so either gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, it's going to promote the mobilization of glucose storage. Uh, so that's a metabolic role for both alpha-1 and beta-2, and that's going to actually come into some degree of importance when we talk about some of the agonists of these, these receptors. Uh, they, they can interfere with, with patients who are diabetic, uh, and so you may need to think about those things, and this is why. And so, even though I didn't go into all of the nitty-gritty details of adrenergic receptors, hopefully you get a good idea here. We will work uh, with this more when we talk about adrenergic agonists and antagonists. But suffice it to say that you have a good idea, a good understanding now. As I said, if you're taking USMLE Step 1, you'll want to know about these G proteins. It is 
important for step one, but if you're not taking step one, don't worry about that. If you have any questions, write me a note below. Otherwise, I will see you next time.